Dr. Crony has come to Gig Harbour to meet the talented Nellie for herself. She wants to understand more about how Nellie perceives the task that she performs on stage. Although Nellie can perform her repertoire of tricks on command, it doesn't tell us much about how flexible or creative her thought processes really are. Nellie recognises dozens of different individual objects used in her stage show and that each one has a specific purpose. But when asked to put an odd-shaped object in the basketball hoop, she clearly questions the logic of that command. Put the ball in a hoop. Now this is interesting because Nellie's having to check this out and she's making a comparison. Nelly, put the ball in the hoop. Huh, look at that. So what Nelly is doing is um, telling us something about what she sees this task accomplishing. And it's putting a round object into that hoop. And so it's a very specific concept she has of what's supposed to be going on here. Okay, Nelly, what kind of animal? This ability to recognize shapes and textures helps explain her stage finale, spelling out the word ham from the alphabet. Nellie can recognize the letters are made of wood, unlike the rest, which are made of plastic. But this trick also tells us something about Nellie's intelligence. So the other thing that Nellie is doing is she's consistently picking out these letters um, in a certain order. And that's important because she has to remember that order. Um, there's a level of learning and memory that are coming into play here. The next task is a game called Win, Stay, Lose, Shift. Candice wants Nelly to guess which one of these objects she has chosen. A green glass and a bell are placed side by side. Picking the glass means treat, picking the bell means no treat. The trick is to work out the rule without any clues. We'll push the object. No, no, Nelly. Nelly, go push the object. Good! Good. Hey. Yay, Nelly! On her third attempt, if Nelly picks out the green glass, it proves she understands the rule. Go push the object. Good! Good. Hey, treat. She didn't get a reward for picking the bell the first time, so she switched and picked the glass. That's exactly what we want to see them doing if they get the rule of win, stay, lose, shift your choice. After years of training Nellie, the results are a big surprise for Priscilla. So we're actually teaching her to be creative, to not use cues from the outside. She's not being trained to, use, to do these tricks. She has to figure it out on herself. It's quite hard, I think, for an older pig to do some of these tasks because, again, we're asking her to shift her thought process a little bit. We're asking her to do things not only that she hasn't done before, but to think completely differently for how she, from how she has um, been taught to work. And so this is probably quite difficult for her, so it's impressive she can do this at all. For the first time ever, the Elvis Project allows the dolphins to use echolocation as a pointing tool to make choices and answer questions. A series of shapes are projected onto an underwater screen. Each shape symbolizes a different type of fish. For example, a square means a mackerel, a cross is a squid. By aiming their echolocation beam at a shape projected on the screen, the dolphins can choose what type of fish they want to eat. The echolocation beam shows up as dots. Green is a weak signal, white is strong. Underwater hydrophones record the echolocation sound signals. The black dots here are the hydrophones, 16 in all and the, the cable just uh, takes the signals from the hydrophone to the computer. When the echolocation beam is strong enough for the computer to read the signal, the trainer's whistle blows and the dolphins get their chosen reward. <laughs> Only three dolphins in the world have been trained to do this. Out of them, Luna was the quickest to grasp the concept
she manages to hit her chosen target almost instantly every time. She remembers. <laughs> Luna is the young dolphin and as such uh, a little bit more motivated. She, she likes to play, to uh, investigate things and she's very eager to, to please the trainers. Each run of the experiment yields different results. It allows Luna to choose what she wants to eat. Some days squid is her favorite, on others it's mackerel. So here are the symbols for uh, Kaplan and squid, and these round and green dots are the trace of the sonar beam. And now uh, mm. Luna hit uh, the squid symbol, and then she made a little buzz of happiness that she managed to trigger it. She can now go back to the trainer and she will be given a squid. And when her work duties are over for the day, it's time for some well-earned rest and play. The Elvis system is still in its infancy. Amundon hopes one day it could be used for other projects, including allowing dolphins to choose toys, play their own music, and even reveal their emotions. Meet Griffin, the star of the avian learning experiment, an experiment to prove that parrots are capable of more than just parroting. What matter? Good birdie. Griffin's human partner in the experiment is Dr. Irene Pepperberg. We started to establish a two-way communication system with a bird that would allow us then to use that system to examine his intelligence. Through this two-way communication with Griffin, Dr. Pepperberg is unlocking the secrets of the bird brain and showing just how much a parrot can understand. Hi, hi, sweet. Hi. For the past 12 years, Griffin and Dr. Pepperberg have worked together. Let's go check email first, okay? Can we go check email first? Yeah, yeah. Griffin is a little bit cautious, a little bit watchful. Griffin is an academic bird who doesn't mince his words. What do you want? You want to go back? Okay. He means what he says, and he says what he means. We're going to do some matter, okay? Tell me what matter. Paper, that's right. Good birdie. There you go. Dr. Pepperberg's simplified language uses the minimum number of words possible. So instead of asking, what is this made of, she asks, matter. Good boy. Griffin can also understand abstract concepts and even has the ability to use numbers. Now listen. How many? Four is right. Good boy. But Griffin has plenty of competition for the title of genius parrot. His main rival has flown in from Tennessee to give a special performance at a top Boston nursery school. Would you like to hear her talk? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell everybody your name? Einstein. This is Einstein. Now, Einstein, can you tell everybody hi? Hello. That's nice. Can you be more polite? Yes, sweetheart. That's pretty sweet. Now, before we start, Einstein, do you need to clear your throat? <coughs> Irene has come to see Einstein firsthand because she's heard of her impressive vocal abilities. Now, Einstein just took a trip all around the world. Well, in Africa, there's a lot of chimpanzees. You do a chimpanzee? <laughs> How about a pig? <laughs> what about one that needs to go on a diet? <laughs> <laughs> Can you sing? <laughs> but today was a very special day for Einstein because it was her birthday. What did you do if you got a peanut? <laughs> Even though Einstein's ability to mimic is impressive, Irene still thinks that Griffin is top of the class when it comes to comprehension. Bumblebees have particularly large and heavy bodies, and flight for them can be a real effort. That's particularly so in spring, when the mornings are cold, and queen bumblebees are just emerging from their winter sleep. It's only a few degrees above freezing, but a queen needs to get started early to look for food. 
The thick, furry hairs on her body help to conserve what heat she manages to generate. At the moment, she's only a few degrees warmer than the surrounding vegetation, as the thermal camera clearly shows. Her body is only marginally more pink than the blue leaves and moss around her. But she has a special way of warming up for flight. She can put her wings out of gear, so that without moving them, she can rev up the wing muscles inside, and that raises the temperature within her thorax by 20 degrees centigrade or even more, as the expanding yellow image on the thermal camera indicates. Her body temperature is now over 30 degrees centigrade. At last, she has a chance of liftoff. She will now be able to visit the spring flowers while it's still too cold for others to do so. The long trumpets of the daffodils retain heat very well, and they're still warm even after their hot-bodied visitors have left. So here's the problem. The elephants need to be able to pull the table closer to gain access to the sunflower seeds. And they need the rope to do that. But if only one of them pulls the rope, the table doesn't move and they both go hungry. So can two elephants figure out they need to work together to solve a brand new problem? From cop. They don't get it first time out, that's for sure. But their four kilogram brains may just be at work. The first thing I think that they learn, and there has to be some learning involved in this, this is a task they've never experienced before. Um, the first thing is that they've learned that their partner needs to be there. And I think in some ways they've learned not only does their partner need to be there, but their partner needs to be doing something. After only three attempts, the smartest elephants solve the puzzle. But Josh wants to know if they understand the concept behind it. So he releases one elephant before the other to see if it'll wait for its partner. After eight years of working with elephants, Josh had a hunch that was going to happen, and now he's got proof. What you're seeing is that the elephants are thinking about cooperation, um, and that actually demonstrates how smart and how well adapted these animals are. It's incredible to prove that animals are smart enough to cooperate.